This past week I was invited to preach and to participate in the open forum of the 25th annual Lubbock Lectureship at the Southside Church of Christ in Lubbock, Texas. Since Lubbock is about a, you ever take 13 hour drive from here, I flew. I can't say that I enjoy flying. Somebody said, what's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? They said an optimist created the airplane. They said the pessimists created the seat belts, the oxygen mask, and the inflatable seat cushions. And then also the hidden life raft. Two pilots are discussing piloting. One said, why did you become a pilot? He said, to overcome my fears. And then the other asked, what fears? Heights? He said, no, dying alone. <laughs> so I enjoyed the lectures. I didn't enjoy flying as much, but I want to preach uh, today the topic that was assigned to me out there on the burial of Jesus Christ. And I want us to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For Paul said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That verb, and he was buried, is in the aorist tense in the Greek, which suggests that he is describing a single event which has definitely taken place at a particular point of time in the past. The burial of our Lord is one of the cardinal facts of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's often been neglected in our preaching. Why is the burial of Christ so significant to us as Christians? I want to discuss eight points why it's significant. Number one. This was a borrowed tomb. Please turn to Matthew 27, 57 through 60. This was a borrowed tomb. Matthew 27, 57, when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple, he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Joseph lovingly laid the body of Jesus in his own tomb. So this tomb was a borrowed tomb. How is that significant? I am reminded of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Jesus laid aside the riches of heaven. Remember how the Lord constantly borrowed everything? He had nothing of his own. He borrowed food, clothing, a coin to give an illustration, and even a donkey with which to enter the city of Jerusalem. In life, he had no bed to call his own. In death, he had no tomb in which to be buried. This was a borrowed tomb. Number two, this was a new tomb. In Matthew 27, 60, it says, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. This was a new tomb. Didn't our Lord deserve that? And Joseph's attitude was one that each of us here can and should seek to emulate. 
He offered unto the Lord his own tomb, a new tomb, which he himself had hewn out of solid rock. And do you not think that God was especially pleased with Joseph's attitude and conduct on this occasion? He was one who realized that his Lord deserved the very best that he had to offer. And so should we. Sacrifice is an essential part of worship and service to God. God once told David to build an altar on Mount Moriah and offer sacrifices. And when Aruna or Ornan offered to give him the threshing floor, and give him everything that he needed. Second Samuel 24, 24 says, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So it says David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Let me ask you a question. Are you putting sacrifice in your sacrifices? David did. And Joseph probably could have found some cheap place to bury the Lord. But instead he gave sacrificially for his Savior. And how inconsistent it is for the redeemed to be cheap in worshiping a Savior who has sacrificed far greater than anyone else to save their soul. We sing a song called Give of Your Best to the Master. Verse 2 says, Give of your best to the Master. Give Him first place in your heart. Give Him first place in your service. Consecrate every part. Give and ye shall be given. God His beloved Son gave. Gratefully seeking to serve him, give him the best that you have. That's what Joseph did. This was a new tomb, number three. This was a secured tomb. You recall that to prevent any opening of the Lord's tomb, the Lord's enemies rolled a stone to its opening set a Roman seal and placed guards at the site. They did everything they could from a human standpoint to make sure that that tomb was secure against any kind of intrusion from either friend or foe. Look at Matthew 27, 64. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last heir shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. The opening to the central chamber would be guarded by a large, heavy disk of rock that would roll along a groove that was slightly depressed at the center in front of the tomb entrance. And this had been done, and this is why the women who visited after the Sabbath were so concerned about it. In Mark 16, 3, and they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And then in addition to the stone, they also sealed the tomb, most likely with a glob of wax imprinted with the signet ring of one of the Romans that was in authority. This was a door that couldn't be opened without breaking the seal, and that would make it a crime. And having given that Roman authentication to the seal, then guards were placed in front of the tomb. Now some claim that enemies stole the body. 
that the body of Jesus was not removed from the tomb can be seen from the following reasons. Number one, they had absolutely nothing to gain from removing it. The body was right where they wanted it to be. And second, the enemies had no intention of removing the body from the tomb. That was the opposite of their intention. They stationed a Roman guard there consisting of 15 to 16 men normally around the tomb because they were determined the body would stay in the tomb. And then there are those that claim that the friends of Christ stole the body. But the fact of the matter is that the Romans secured the tomb to prevent that very thing from happening. And the Roman guard was changed every six hours. And given that death was the punishment for abandoning a post or neglecting duties while on, on duty, it defies reason that anyone could have easily stolen the body of Christ. The soldiers' own lives were at stake over the body of Christ. So this was a secured tomb, number four. This was a fulfilling tomb. Why was our Lord buried at all? Because it was foretold by Scripture. Jonah's experience in the belly of the great fish prefigured it. Matthew 12, 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. God's power fulfilled these types and prophecies in Jesus' burial. And even though Paul doesn't say that Christ was buried according to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, yet it was true and is probably implied there. Turn over to Isaiah 53 and verse 9 and you'll see a prophecy of the burial of our Lord. Isaiah 53 and verse 9 He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. I don't think that rendering is clear. The New King James Version says, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. The New American Standard says, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Among the six different translations that I consulted in my study, only those last two offer the contrast that I think is intended in the meaning of this verse. The facts are Jesus was not buried with the wicked. In wicked there is plural. Jesus was not buried with the wicked. Our Lord's life was above reproach his speech was always sincere and true. He had done no criminal act. He had not failed in his work or in his mission. And therefore the father saw to it that his faithful son would receive an honorable, honorable burial. And so the fact was Jesus was not buried with the wicked, plural, but with the rich. And there the word is singular with a rich singular in a rich man's tomb and you know that was highly unusual you see the Romans never buried their crucified victims and the Jews had a public burial place for all who died as criminals it was a pit their bodies were just cast into a pit but what were these obstacles to Jehovah God? God had predicted that our Lord would be buried in a rich man's tomb. And this was fulfilled. And how thrilling it is that the compassion of Joseph was used by God to fulfill the scriptures. And this establishes for us the inspiration of the scriptures as well as the deity of Christ. Number five. This was a transforming tomb. 
Two great and important men had a part in the burial of our Lord. First, there was Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. That would be like our Supreme Court today. And he was one who had not agreed to their wicked decision to kill Christ, according to Luke 23 and verse 50. Maybe he stayed at home while they convened. He was a rich man who waited for the kingdom of God. And then you have Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews whom the Lord had taught the doctrine of the new birth in John chapter 3. Now let's turn to John 19. And let's look at verses 38 through 41 and notice the account. John 19, 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of mirth and aloes about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. Now there's something mentioned about these two fellows that's significant. It says Joseph was a secret disciple. And it says Nicodemus was one who came to Jesus by night. Now we don't know for sure about Nicodemus and why he came by night, but it's my suspicion that since they were both in high positions, they were afraid that their belief in the Lord would be made public. But what transforming power there was in these closing events in the life of our Lord. Turn to Mark 15, 43 now. And notice what he said of Joseph. In Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly. Don't miss that. Went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Can you just imagine the courage that must have taken on the part of this secret disciple who was afraid of the Jews? And yet we see this same boldness evidenced in the life of the apostles. In Acts 4, 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. These men had been with Jesus. He had transformed them into bold men into his service. Friends, the tomb of our Lord was significant because it was a transforming tomb. Number six. This was a vacant tomb. Friends, Christianity is a religion of the empty, vacant tomb. The risen Redeemer, the ascended Master, and the glorified King who reigns on the right hand of God. And the tomb of our Lord is significant because it was a vacant tomb. There was the displaced stone. Mark 16, 4, and when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great. How was the stone removed? We read in Matthew 28, 2 and 3, and behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. Why did the angel remove the stone? Not for Jesus to get out, but for others to get in and see that he was already gone. And then there was the angelic announcement. How wonderful must have been the words of Matthew 28 and 6 to their ears. 
the angelic announcement of the resurrection was, He is not here, for he is risen. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Then there was the agreement of the Lord's enemies. In Matthew 28, 11 through 15, it relates how they fabricated a story as to why the tomb was empty when they told the soldiers to say that the disciples had came and took the body of Jesus away. And the soldiers were bribed to keep quiet. Well, even that admits that the tomb was found empty. And then there's the testimony of the Lord's friends. The women who came to the tomb found it empty. Mark 6, 4 and 8. Peter and John came to the tomb. They found only grave clothes. John 20, 3 and 7. And that leads me to this. There's the testimony of the grave clothes themselves. Look at John 20. Verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Peter arrived and went straight into the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lie. And that second word, saw, is different from that earlier word, seeth. John uses the word theoreo. That's the word from whence we derive our English word theory. Peter not only observed the grave clothes, but he's studying them for clues to find out What's happened here? What's going on? And the clothes were not folded as if Jesus had unwound them from his body and then placed them in two neat piles on the shelf like we would fold our pajamas in the morning. The wrappings were in the position where the body had lain and the head cloth was where the head had been. If the body had been stolen, why remove the wrappings? The truth is, Jesus had arisen, passing straight through those grave clothes, which he left undisturbed as a silent proof that death could not hold him. And then in the next place, this was a typical tomb. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 5, Paul says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be planted in the likeness of his resurrection. In these verses, we are taught that Christians have been buried with the Lord in the waters of baptism, that they might arise to walk in newness of life. Those verses would have no meaning if Christ had not been buried. But just as Jesus died and was buried, and rose from the grave. So we, died of sin, are buried in the water grave of baptism and are raised to walk in newness of life. There are those today that teach that baptism is just like a badge or a uniform that merely gives evidence that the person is already saved. But the New Testament does not teach that baptism is merely a badge or an outward sign of an inward grace. Baptism is a symbolic act, but what does it symbolize? Previous forgiveness? Oh no. Romans 6 shows us that baptism symbolizes the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And the benefits of Jesus' blood, which were shed in his death for our sins, 
are received when each individual in penitent faith dies to sin and is buried in a watery tomb. And if forgiveness of sins occurs before baptism, well then the new life of the saved individual would also begin before baptism. And yet Paul says that new life occurs after baptism. You bury a dead man, not a live one. This was a typical tomb. And then eighth and finally, this was a comforting tomb. Paul wrote to the sorrowing Thessalonians whose hearts were troubled over the souls of lost ones gone before. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also that sleep in Jesus shall God bring with him. Tremendous power to comfort resides in the connection between Christ's resurrection and our own. Between his second coming and our own resurrection. And this comforting tomb demonstrated that Christ was the Son of God, Romans 1, 4. It validates the forgiveness that he offers, 1 Corinthians 14, 7. It makes possible our new life in Christ, Romans 8 and verse 11. And it guaranteed the promise that we will have a resurrected body in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. In a classic example of episode of Alfred Hitchcock, there was a woman that was convicted of murder. And she was sentenced to life in prison. And when the woman is sentenced, she screams at the judge and she promises that she will escape and get even. The guards forcibly remove the woman. They escort her to the prison bus. And as the bus enters the prison, the woman notices an older man covering up a grave outside the prison wall. Once inside the prison, the woman befriends the old man and learns that the old man is going blind. And the woman offers to help the old man if he would in turn help her, if the old man would help her to escape the prison. She would in turn give him money for surgery on his eyes. Well, at first the old man refuses. However, the woman eventually wears the old man down. The plan was simple. The next time the bell tolled, signaling somebody's death, the woman would slip down into the morgue and she would slide into the coffin with a corpse. Early the next day, the old man would roll the coffin out and he would bury it. And then a little later, the old man would return and he would uncover the coffin and the woman would be free. Oh, it seemed like a perfect plan. Late one night, the woman heard the toll of the bell. Someone had died. She made her way to the morgue. And in the darkness, the woman lifted up the lid on the coffin and she slipped inside. A few hours later, she felt the coffin being rolled outside and lowered into the grave. She smiled as she heard dirt being shoveled onto the coffin. She just knew that she was almost free. Everything was going according to plan. However, as time dragged on and on, the woman began to worry. Where was the old man? Why hadn't he dug the coffin up and freed her? Finally, in desperation, the woman lit a match. 
And she glanced over at the corpse next to her. And to her horror, it was the old man. Her only hope lay buried in the coffin beside her. And friends, I fear that a lot of people's hopes are going to be buried in the coffin with them. But my hope is in a risen, living, and victorious Christ. In the gospel that we preach centers around the three cardinal facts of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and all of it according to the scriptures. The tomb that lifts the gloom from all Christians' tombs is the empty tomb of the risen Lord. Why not give your life to him who gave his all for you? If you need to come in gospel obedience, or if you need to come rededicating your life to Christ this hour, won't you come as together we stand and sing?